Did you say to yourself, when I retire, I'm going to research my family and write a book? Well, today's special guest, Linda Critchlow White, she did it. Learn how she did it and what she found. Welcome. How are you today? Um, we're here. Welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. I'm Shamel Jordan, your host. We, you can watch us on YouTube, Facebook, and Philly Cam. And it is so nice to have you here, whether you are here with us live or in replay. Let us know where you are. Announce where you are. And are you a proud member of a genealogy group or society? You know, don't let Linda hear that you're not a member of a genealogy group. So you need to share your group because you may have a, a genealogy soul out there that needs a home. We have a fantastic show for you today. Um, first up is those crazy family stories. We all have them. And have you tried to document them? I would love to see in the chat any of your crazy family stories because time permitting, we could talk about and figure out what documents you need to look up and search to document that crazy family story. So that's our first quick start. And you know, we don't leave you just with one. It's like a potato chip, those quick starts. You've got to have more than one. Our second quick start is when race isn't just black and white. And that's with our special guest, author, Linda Crutchlow White. So let's get started with our first quick start. Let me bring on my buddies. First up, editor and columnist, Jim Beidler. And hey, Jim. And Hello. Technology tip of the day, Michael John Neal. How are you, Michael? I'm good. How are you, Chanel? I'm good. I'm good. So you guys want to talk about, you know, I know that as crazy as the two of you guys are, your family stories are probably much crazier <laughs> than what you're going to talk about today. Um, so how you guys been? Pretty good. Real well. Pretty good. Good. Yep. Pretty good. Pretty good. So let's take a look at, um, I have a really crazy family story and I don't know if I can ever prove it. And you guys have to tell me if I could possibly prove this. And I want you guys, like I said, out there, please announce where you are. And if you have a crazy family story, please put it in chat. So I'm going to throw mine out there. The New Jersey Turnpike has tickets. You get a ticket when you get on. And when you get off, you put the ticket in, they give the ticket, and you pay that amount of money. So there's a story that says that my grandfather got from North Jersey to South Jersey so quickly that just by virtue of the time that he got onto the turnpike, he got a ticket when he got off. Because he got there, like, no one, it's not possible for anybody to drive that quickly <laughs> without speeding. So do you guys think I could ever prove something like that? Well, if you find that ticket, you could. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I can anecdotally say I do remember my parents saying that, uh, and I think it was New York Thruway that they they were on that they time you, and that if you if you go too fast, you're you're not just going to pay the toll; you're going to pay a fine. Now, I, I don't. <laughs> I was like seven years old, you know, but so I I can't testify. So that was in the I horse and right. buggy days. Is that when that? Was? <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I'm thinking of a word for you, and I bet you are. <laughs> and, and 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 it's something about a horse and I something about is. a buggy. <laughs> All right, before we get started, let's see who we have here today. Paula is number one. South Jersey is always got my back. She'll watch in Genealogy Quick Start. Hey, Paula from um, West Defford. And she says, Jim, thanks for the hit. Yes, Jim, Jim comes up with some pretty good stuff from time to time. <laughs> hey, Judy from Chicagoland. Hello, Marion from Mass. 
Hello, Dean from AAGG. How are you today? I'm scrolling too fast. Hey, Angela Allen. Angela Allen is also AKA my photographer in Houston. Also by way of the um, AAGHSC Chicago again. Hey, Denise from the Netherlands. Nice to have you here. Um, I was having flashbacks of my trip there. I really need to get back to the Netherlands. Um, do they need genealogy people to come over here like Jim and Mike? Jim and Michael, do you guys have any ancestors in the Netherlands? I do I do have some ancestry in the oh. late 1600s in the Netherlands. Yeah. Oh, we might need to go to the Netherlands. I have some from the same time period. Oh, that, and I'll find some. Um <laughs> So we have Linda from Florida. Hi, Linda from Florida. We have Baton Rouge. My finger is like scrolling like a crazy person today. I can barely see. Hello, Shanna. Hey, June from New Hampshire. And Jean, I got you this time from Collegeville, AAGG, Augs Family Quest. She is the genealogy group, just groupie, I would say. Hey, Bursley, I haven't seen you in a while from Rockford, Illinois. And we have Marion. Um, she said newspapers that I could look for my grandfather in the newspapers. Okay, let's check that out. Hey, Susan from Reading, PA. Nice to have you. Um, June has grandfathers and dads with lead feet too. Hey, Shalina, how are you? Did you write your family story yet, Shalina? All right, let's get going with the quick start today. Jim and Michael are doing those crazy family stories. So let's get going with step one, which is to record every piece of family lore. You guys yeah. want to talk about that? Well, the whole, the whole idea here is that some of the craziest ones you'll end up realizing if you, if you throw them, throw them back, and say, well, that's just too crazy to ever be true. I'm not going to research that in any way. You may, you may end up missing something. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, that's the import of that. I would say if you want to rule a thumb on that is that there's no family story that is going to come down 100% uh, accurate, let alone verifiable. Uh, but likewise, it's rare that one is completely made up out of whole cloth. There's usually a nugget, a little seed in there of truth, and it's your your job to try to try to get that out of the the embellishment that's uh, surrounding it. I would say clearly indicate that it's family lore or family myth when you're transcribing it somewhere or including it somewhere so that somebody else doesn't think it's all fact. But including some of the, the, the craziness or silliness gives you a little perspective on the family and their viewpoints and how they, what myth they tried to perpetuate. And, and that can be helpful too. And if you know what crazy things they thought were true, that can explain some of the errors perhaps in records as well that you find. Absolutely. Yep. I love that recorded anyway. So let's move on to step two of this quick start, those crazy family stories. Step two is to search for home sources. Jim always reminds me of this. This is like, I always forget home sources. Well, you know, I, I came, I, I came, I came of age in genealogy in the 1980s when Oh, uh, you know, your first instinct wasn't to go to a computer who had a computer, uh, wasn't to, uh, you know, go, go to the library because you were having to go somewhere. You went to your attic. Oh, uh, you know, and, and of course, for me, it was helpful since I'm, well, at the time I wasn't living at home, but my, my parents' home has always been my parents home you know they did they they well my, my mother uh, never moved until she went to a nursing home the last few months of her life and indeed in our in our attic uh we had seven trunks from different family members uh so there were not a huge trove of uh actual genealogy documents but there were quilts uh there were postcard books fr from from my great great aunt who 
I think was a bit of a hoe uh, <laughs> because she's she goes on the back of these postcards. She's got different guys all writing her. Hey, Sal, what a great time we have. Can't wait till we get together again. Stuff like that. So, but so. Uh, I yeah. apologize, Aunt Sal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but, uh, but, but the one, the one, the one that kind of gave me the, the inkling and, and apologies to the, to the, the most careful uh, uh, GQS viewers, because I, I may have mentioned this before. Uh, it was in what, what I will call uh, former in-law relatives in their, in their um, uh, lore that uh, the immigrant ancestor from the second half of the 1800s was named Anthony Tobin, uh, and that uh, and that Anthony was actually a Polish Jew named Tobinski. Okay. And this 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 just oozed crazy, uh, and and uh, and but but. Yeah, and so so much that it was ignored at first, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the home sources uh, kind of indicated, and also the preponderance of things like naturalizations and so forth showed that Tobin families came from the British Isles, either Welsh or Irish. So that was that was how the the search was was oriented uh, until. Until then, we went on to step three and went to research additional sources, really research the things that we should have done to begin with <laughs> beyond the censuses. What's more basic than that? But I but I kind of figured that had already had already been done. Uh, and um, instead, then when we started looking through the censuses, well, if you can uh, can call those up for me, Shamel. Uh, 1920 census. I mean, there he is, is indeed uh, Anthony Tobin. But when we go to the uh, to the close up, I think we can can see that. Oh, uh, and it says that his parents were born in Russia and that their native tongue was Polish. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like Ruck Row. Uh, so <laughs> so much for all Tobin's being being um british isles yeah british isles stuff and and there were in the uh uh you know some poles you know depending depending on whether the birthplace was was uh as the boundaries were in 1920 or the birthplace of the parents when they were actually born russia might make sense because of course until the end of world war one there was no poland for more than a century so so that was that was given some cred to uh to this whole thing mm. so then we kept going to the 1910 census and in the 1910 census after after a lot of searching because he's under hoban instead of tobin um, uh, uh. yeah then here we have his parents being born in Germany, both of them being mm -hmm. born in, in Germany. So, so, and that, and that actually, well, they're, they're again in the pre-World War I German empire, there were a lot of Poles, but the, the flaw to this evolution of so forth is that none of those areas went to Russia after World War I. So there was still something hinky here or something. Oh, <laughs> so. uh, yeah. So then if you go back to, uh, to 1900, uh, then you're going to find that he, he's Anthony Hoban. You know, so it took a oh, lot no, of change the letter. Yeah. Well, and it might actually be this one here. When I, when I looked, looked at it and called this up, uh, and prep for this show, uh, I thought, could, could that be a, like a lowercase t and that's like a check mark on the end? So I'm not even sure what's what's going on here, <laughs> but I know it's the right man because all the other things uh, ratchet, up, ratchet up. But now here, instead of him being born he's in Pennsylvania, German. well, he's, it's saying he's born in Germany 
as well as his parents, mm. and that he immigrated, uh, obviously, as a child, according to this, okay. uh, in 1871, mm -hmm. even though couldn't find any, uh, any ship list that he was on with other people or, or anything like that. Uh, so all of this together then led me to go to the Schuylkill County marriage licenses, and unfortunately I couldn't find an image, but uh, there be darn, uh, he is listed as Anton Dubinsky. Not Tobinsky, Dubinsky, but the T and the D are, no. are, are no. consonant cognates. And, and so it's like, okay, no verification on the religion part, but he definitely was from Eastern Europe, not the, not the British Isles. Yeah. So this is, this is one where, 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 you know, had a super long laugh. Well, he who laughs last <laughs> laughs best and nobody, and nobody's laughing anymore on, uh, on this particular one. So. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, and what and while I, while I'm while I'm I'll, I'll kind of kind of shoot my thoughts and then we'll move on to to Michael. Another thing that was kind of sort of crazy, you know, I mentioned how I had these seven uh, seven um, uh, uh, trunks in the attic, uh, not toys in the attic, seven trunks <laughs> in the attic, and and uh, when I was beginning genealogy, I said to my mom, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna search the attic. And she's like, well, there's nothing of use that you're going to find up there. <laughs> oh, man. You know, in my in what would have been my grandmother's trunk, there was a family Bible from her mother's family. In other words, my dad's mother's mother's family. Go Dab is the name. The attic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. D-A-U-B. And, and uh, in that family Bible was able to find an additional generation. Uh, most of the Bible was done in kind of like a gold leaf script by a scrivener, uh, but they made one additional notation in the uh, in the lighter print here, uh, and that's a Peter Dobb uh, dying and uh, in 1903, and that his parents were Peter and Molly Dobb. And I thought, oh man, I'm going to break free of all these darn Germans. And I'll ha finally have an Irish ancestor. Uh, well, <laughs> think again, Jim. What what I later learned is that Molly was a nickname uh, uh, in the Pennsylvania Germans, amongst the Pennsylvania Germans, for um, Magdalena, uh, which is a German a German name in use among the the Pennsylvania Germans. So, so that was that was one where where I was making making up a crazy story. <laughs> and didn't uh, didn't turn out to be anything. <laughs> I love that one, and it wasn't like you had to dig really hard. They were the census records really helped you out. And no, no, you had the gold no. in the attic. We are no longer calling them trunks in the attic. It's gold <laughs> in the attics. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Michael, how about you? Well, it's kind of just building on what Jim said. You want to look at the. You know, start with the census and, and the, the vital records, but then other records in the courthouse um, that might give more details than you've currently got. Uh, in Jim's situations, a naturalization might have helped a little bit. It's kind of hard to say. Yeah, in that era, there's not a lot of detail in those records, unfortunately. Sure. Um, but, you know, any other courthouse records are probably the place to start. To, in addition to some federal records, perhaps, to try to document the details in that in that story. You want to use that as a springboard to decide what to research, to try to see if the facts in the story are true or not true. So who's this fella here? This is my second great grandfather. And the, the story about him very briefly, he was in the civil war. And when he came home, he was riding a horse. I don't know what that had to do with anything, but <laughs> When he got close to home, he saw this girl um, coming home from where she'd been working as a hired girl or something. And in the story, he doesn't really speak to her, but it says he met Nancy on the way home. And when he got home, he told his mother he'd met the girl he was going to marry. And that was, the, that was the story. I, what I always thought was odd was in the story, there's no mention of him having any discussion with this woman he's going to marry, but he goes home and he tells his mother. Um, and... <laughs> The, the interesting thing about the story was when we 
I went to go try to, to document it. The Civil War service was easy to document. The marriage was easy to document. But I'm not sure if you've got those images up um, from do. Riley and Nancy's little story there. Um, but she was, she didn't live, she, her, she and her, this is his, uh, one of his from the compiled military service record, uh, 26 years old, uh, blue eyes and dark hair. He actually had hair in that picture when he was older, which is extremely frustrating. Um, but there's his enlistment. So he was in the Civil War Company D, the 70th Illinois Volunteer Can Infantry. Can you take a second to tell us how we get enlistment records? Are they available online or do these, we These are online. These are the compiled military service records that were created from at the National Archives that were created um, with the intent of helping to, to uh, validate service uh, for uh, military pensions for and, and a few other things. But these are online at Fold3. There's other places where they're also online. Um, this is a color copy that I got from the National Archives, but uh, black and white images are on full three and other websites as well. So that's something you can get you can get online. And the this was from his compiled military service record, which are transcribed cards. This was from the uh, a descriptive book. It says, but from muster rolls and payrolls and other things. That information was transcribed onto these cards that created what's called the compiled military service record um, that was used when uh, service details needed to be documented. Uh, that's what we've got here for uh, for good old Riley. So I was able to document the service. That was one thing that was easy to document. This is a picture you you kind of been on my case about not having pictures of these people so this is a picture of nancy obviously it's not when they were at the age they got married this is much later in life but i do have a picture of her um, very um, nice not sure where that was taken this is the 1865 illinois state census for the township where the families lived and what was really kind of interesting or interesting to me was he enlisted in 1862 and Nancy's family, their neighbors in the census and, on, and property records also indicated they were neighbors. She did not live there when he left to enlist in the, in the service. Um, but in 1864, based on land records, and then 1865 here based on the uh, state census, William Newman, that's her dad, they're, a, they're listed adjacent in the census. So she was a new girl when he got home from the war. She was not there when he um you know, when yeah. he enlisted. So, mm -hmm. you know, she was somebody he didn't know when he came, when he came back. Now, interestingly enough, his brother, Mary, his brother also married a woman named Nancy Newman, who was my Nancy Newman's first cousin, but that's a whole nother story <laughs> altogether. Um, but the, you know, this, we, we don't often think about state census, but this kind of helped to dovetail the fact they were neighbors. It wasn't like he met her in Kentucky or someplace, you know, she was, probably out walking around or whatever he saw her when he came home. I love state census records. Often we focus so much on the federal census, which are every 10 years, but these state census records are, you know, in between often. Michael, where do you get state census records? This, the, these are online at Family Search and at Ancestry. Uh, back in the day, we'd have had to use this archaic thing. I think it's called microfilm, but they're, <laughs> they're online at Family Search and at Ancestry and they're, they're indexed, you know, so it's you sometimes have to do manual searches because sometimes the originals are bad. If you think sometimes the, the federal census images are bad, I've seen state census records that are much worse. Um, so sometimes you do will have to do a manual search of those because when the images are difficult to read, the transcriptions become more creative. We'll use that <laughs> that gentle term for that. Um, that's true. That's true. Uh, June said, "My dad had a lead foot." Let's see if we, if we could show. My dad had a lead foot. Would always stop at the side of the road on the main turnpike for a picnic lunch that way the five kids got a break and he didn't get a ticket <laughs> <laughs> it's called smart adjusting dad. the time yeah <laughs> <laughs> smart dad i love that um so let's finish with the quick start um you guys showed your your records you know you're researching home sources which i always forget which are mike jim you have gold in our houses and we don't even know it um then you want to collate your information. Did you guys have anything to say about collating? What does that even mean? 
Well, well, in the case of those Tobin, Hoban, Hobins, uh, <laughs> Dobinsky, uh, it's to go through, you know, all your records and try to make sense of how this might make sense. There's don't. There, there are contradictions that won't be resolved. Either he was born in Pennsylvania or he was born in Germany or he was born something or uh, other other completely uh but to at least try because sometimes it will be due to border changes that the birthplace changes in the census and then that can help you narrow it down to a smaller discrete area collate would be put the dates in a chronology put the locations on a map transcribe the names and see how and the ages to see if they're consistent enough if you do all three of those things you're really on your way to getting as much out of the information as possible and spotting any inconsistencies as well. Very true. Very true. Um, so we have step five is to then search again with any new information that you came up during your collating because the whole, we are such collectors, right? Grab, grab, grab. And it's really that collating and analyzing where we come up with all of these ideas and ways to um, information that we have and we don't realize we have. So, yes, I love, love, love that. So let's go over the steps for those crazy family stories. Step one is to record every piece of family lore, even if you don't believe it. Step two, search for home sources. Step three, research additional sources. Step four, collate your information. Step five, search again with the new information. Did you guys have any final tips for that, those crazy family stories? Other than just, tra even if you think they're totally bogus, transcribe them and clearly indicate it's a story. You'll be glad later you wrote it down because they're, like, like Jim mentioned, there's bits and pieces of truth to all of these things. And if you just, that's just grandma being loopy <laughs> and didn't write any of it down later, you may wish you could have had to look at to see what might have been true out of that. And definitely always write down who said what, because I had people who told me they didn't say that. And I'm like, yes, you did. In 1998, <laughs> May 12th, you told me. Oh, okay. All right. Don't, don't. And the, and the moral to that story is don't mess with Shamel. She always has the receipts. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for those crazy family stories from my crazy regular guests. Thank you. See you guys you. soon. <laughs> All right, let's get ready for our next quick start. Hello. You know, right now, identity and family story are just central themes for all of us. Who will tell your story? I ask this question all the time. Your story, you must realize, will include the stories of others, of course. How will you tell their stories? How will you share their stories? How will you share their identities? How will you share identities that might be purposefully hidden? This quick start today will set you off on the right path. Welcome to Genealogy Quick Start with our special guest, Linda Crutchlow White. Linda is really just an inspiration to us all. You know, she put her retirement to work, genealogically speaking, and she's going to tell us all about it when she does a quick start called When Race Isn't Just Black and White. Just a quickie about Linda, she is a native Washingtonian and she's the president of the James Dent Walker chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. And she does so many other things, like we would need 20 minutes just to tell you 
all that she does. So everyone, let us welcome Linda. Hi, Linda. Hello, Shamel, and thank you so much for those generous, kind words. <laughs> and thanks you for are, <laughs> You are an inspiration to us all. Um, and Linda, all of our special guests, we ask them to share their one minute genealogy story, you know, how you got started and how you knew you were hooked. All right, so there's a story there. In 2006, my husband, Eric, and I accepted responsibility for an elderly cousin that was Connie, cousin Connie, Constance Glover Bruce. She was 92 at the time, had been living in a house that her mother had purchased in 1945. Her mother died in 1977. Constance continued to stay in the house and in 2006 got such that she couldn't stay alone. She said, nobody will look after me. So I managed to say, Eric and I will. So with that, we didn't literally have to take care of her on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, Connie said, you don't have to do the work. You just have to make sure it's done. But she uh, went into an assisted living facility and we had to clean out her house. And honest to goodness, we had no idea what lied beyond the front door. Because as I said, Goldie died in 1977. They never threw anything away. There were letters, diaries, photographs, all kinds of stuff that revealed a lot about the family history, including the fact that Goldie was the granddaughter, I'm sorry, was the daughter of a woman who had been enslaved at Appomattox by the very man in whose house General Lee surrendered to General Grant. And there was more and more and more and more that made me wanna dig deeper. So um, Linda, I hear so many people who are cleaning out and I had, there's a guy, he's probably not here today because normally he's one of the first three people to announce he's 60 boxes in, 60 <laughs> boxes in, and he's still going with the clean out. So that's very interesting um, that cousin Connie helped <laughs> to get you into genealogy. So mm -hmm. Linda, today, let's go ahead and jump right in for your quick start, which we are calling, uh, where is it? When race isn't just black and white. So um, how did this become an, a topic for you, Linda? Because one of the things that we found in the house, well, I mentioned letters and a few of the letters made reference to an ancestor who had passed. I, and I use that term carefully, but actually even before that, uh, but after I had kind of gotten a little bit into genealogy, I was on Ancestry one day and saw, received a message that someone had borrowed one of my photos. In fact, it's a photo, you can see it behind me. <laughs> you can see a man and a lady, how coincident. The lady to, I guess it's to your right. That's uh -huh. my great grandmother. Someone had borrowed her picture. <clears throat> And I wrote to this person to say, who are you? Because I didn't recognize the name. You know, sometimes when we see uh, other folks on Ancestry, we have a clue who they are. Yes. This person did not seem to be a relative. So I said, who are you? Da, da, da. And he wrote me right back, said he's not really a relative, but he was helping one of his relatives who is part of my extended family. And the person who he's helping happens to be someone who's living as white today. And this was a black person. Matter of fact, I've learned that he's active in the genealogy circuit. He lives in um, Michigan. You might have know, might know of him. I won't mention his name now, but the point is he was helping this other person. So he pulled my picture, which was fine. I love that. I think that's one of the nice things about ancestry. That's what that's cousin cousin bait to me. Like, you know, we have a buddy cousin Russ. He used to say those trees in our pictures are cousin bait. That's how you wheel in your family. I love it. Cousin bait. I like that. But he, um, he explained who some of these other people were. He actually put me in touch with some of the white descendants who are living today. Some of whom are young. Like there's one guy who lived in Arkansas. All <laughs> and right, said, before you tell the whole story, Linda, let's okay. go ahead and do the quick okay. story. <laughs> mm -hmm. So step one for when race isn't just black and white is, oops, we're step one. Sorry, when race isn't just black and white, 
Um, step one was to, and for some reason, I never bring over step one. Step one is to understand race in America. Mm -hmm. And you have some books that you think um, would represent race in America. Let me share my screen and you could tell us why these books are, you think are important um, just as a sample of race in America. Sure. So the book you see now is Jefferson's Children. And the author of that book is Shannon Lanier, who you see holding the two children, um, one black, one white. The picture to the left is actually my son, my mother, and my grandson <laughs> with Shannon. Shannon was a roommate of my son at Kent State University uh, back in 2000. Oh. So the point is, and Shannon, Shannon is one of the black descendants of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And what I wrote, when I read this book, honestly, it was a revelation to me. I was a way grown. I mean, <laughs> my son was in college, right? And I'm looking at it saying, you mean black people can be descended from white people and white people descended from black people? Sure. I mean, it is so obvious. And yet it's something that we don't really stop and think about. But Shannon lays it out. And this book is actually written for young people. So I also like to say that this is the best book for what some people want to call critical race theory. Mm -hmm. It's for children. And it just tells the real history. Nobody's yeah. making up anything. It's like, <laughs> what did our president do? What happened afterwards? And all of that. And then okay. in this book, it might be another slide, um, Shamel where one of the descendants of Thomas Jefferson attends um, college at, um, which, which women's school was it? At any rate, one of, she passed for white in order to attend the college. The name will come to me in a minute. And then that woman, she attended Radcliffe. No, not Radcliffe. It'll come to me attended the school in the late 1800s. But one of her descendants is still living. And she's featured in Shannon's book and says the family faded to white over time. So the family had been descendants of the Hemings who were theoretically black, but race in America continues to be so complicated. But it is because when you say fear that she was theoretically black, like, why is she theoretically black as opposed to theoretically white? Like, to rate to race in America is defined based off of, you know, if you have any black in you, then you're black. Like, that's right. what America says race is. That's what America says. And that's what they started at the very beginning. You got to be one or the other. With that mix of mulatto coming in and this and that. In the census, censuses, they had to make a choice. You were this or you were that. And some of these same people are black one year, Negro another year, mulatto another year, and white another year. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that. You have some pretty, pretty interesting <laughs> examples. But I want you to talk about this other book that you said um, might be a good um, resource for understanding race in America. Because I think um, what you're trying to say here in studying race in America is the history. We got to understand the history and what it meant in America. Because sometimes it just really, um, it could be bothersome, the definitions, but it's important to understand what they were so that you can understand what you're looking at when you're looking at the records. This is another record neither black nor white yet both um tell us about this book yes so you heard me mention that america created these laws and so one of the most ironic of the laws was that it was illegal for black and white people whatever black and white is to have relations but those white founding fathers were the major culprits, if you will, <laughs> they were, they were allowed, if you will, to have relations with black women that produced so many offspring that became, again, this is complicated, mixed race. And of course, 
there were a lot of reasons they did this. One was pure greed and, you know, to satisfy the, their lust. The other part, of course, was to provide more increase. And they created the laws that said the increase of the enslaved woman became the property where they became enslaved, which means they were the property of the man who created him, who also was the same man <laughs> who said, no, you can't do this. This is against the law. But they fixed the law to work for themselves. And there's so many laws. The whole thing, the one drop piece, and it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. It it's is like, how do, you, how do you even say this stuff? You talk about crazy family stories. And then <laughs> it's like, how does this come out of anybody's mouth? Whether we're talking 200, 300 years ago or today, it kind of doesn't make sense. But it's right there. But it is what it is, right? And How about I, two thirds of a person, you know, and all that kind of stuff. How did they fix themselves to create those laws? And then how it fast forwards to today is people want to blame us when we are angry. And I'm not angry. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, I, I just like to tell the truth. Exactly. People, exactly. So, yeah, understanding the laws really helps. And for a genealogist, of course, understanding the laws help you to understand that there might be specific records that were created that are documenting uh, these people, um, possibly mixed race people. Um, so, Linda... Let's take a look at your, um, so that's studying the history of that. Let's mm -hmm. now talk about the big P word. I didn't hear, I heard the P word when I heard, um, when I first read Nella Larson's book mm -hmm. about passing in school. And so can you just explain what passing means from a, I don't know if other, how many other um, ethnicities might use the word passing. I guess mm -hmm. there's, aspects of that everywhere, but can you explain what that means? Right. So passing simply means representing yourself as something that you're not. Now, it's not always a bad thing. Gay people identify as straight sometimes. Maybe a straight person would identify as gay, depending on, upon where they are, for what reason. Native Americans attempted to live as white people in some cases. Then there were stories you hear of some white people or black people living as Native Americans, or at least living in the Native American community. You hear of Chinese people, Oriental people, um, doing something to their eyes so that they don't look Oriental in order to blend in with the Anglo community, so to speak. And in this country, until fairly recently, most of the time when immigrants came to this country, and of course the, the nation is built on immigrants, they chose not to speak their native language. It's been relatively recently that we have glorified our original cultures. And in some ways we always did. I mean, because different communities had um, Chinatown, Little Italy, and so on. But the goal was to learn a new language, uh, English, and become Americanized. Blend so in. Blend in. <laughs> so that's kind of another way of passing. And then among those who appeared Black or who for whatever reason were designated as Black, Negro, colored, but could were light enough to live as white, there are stories where they were colored uptown and white downtown. Uh -oh. They might have had um, a law degree or any other type of position. Maybe somebody was just a clerk in an office but they or a, a clerk in a department store. I've, I've really heard about these kinds of people in fairly recent history who worked different places, were able to get the jobs because they happened to be light, but they did not say, well, I'm black or white. <laughs> So it's a very, very, very complicated story. So tell us about this as another, you had mentioned this would be um, a, a good book for people to understand America and race. Yes. So this is a book, I actually haven't met the author, but I knew someone who knew her. 
who passed this book along to me. And it's another family history. And it, uh, <laughs> Shamel keeps saying, everybody's got to write their family history. And don't even worry about it, whether you think it's a good story, bad story. It's your story. So <laughs> but in the case of this one, some of the family members apparently had passed. But this woman, whose picture is there, uh, well, her granddaughter wrote a poem about her and said she could have passed. She was black, but, and she could have passed as white. Her closest brother had even passed, but she refused and he moved on, never heard from him again. Wow. So, wow. And many of us have stories like that. And the other interesting thing is sometimes people look at me, I'm brown, I'm black, you know, and how could you have relatives who had passed, but the families just get so mixed up over years, over the years. That they do, that they do. So mm -hmm. Linda, let's move on to step three, which is to do general research. Um, so let's, oh, first I wanted to show this, which actually, you know, was a part of opening it all up, um, is your, um, I don't know if I want to show that now. Let's move on to step three. <laughs> we'll show that next is, um, to look at general U.S. research. And so, yeah, I do have to show that. I want to show your book. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. This was your retirement goal, right? <laughs> yes. So tell us about this book here. So this evolved largely from all the stuff that we found in Connie and Goldie's house. If you look at the group picture, second from the top on the right, Goldie is on the first row on the left. This picture would have been taken about 1901, just before the family moved from Lynchburg, Virginia. Goldie was born in Lynchburg, Virginia, and they migrated to Boston in 1901. The elder people sitting down are James Glover and his wife, Lucy Glover. Lucy and her mother had been enslaved in Appomattox by Wilmer McLean. And that was such a revelation to me. So all the rest of those people are, are their children. The woman standing in the back, second from left, is the same woman you saw in the photo behind me a little while ago. We'll see now. them bigger. We'll see them bigger. Oh, good. So, yeah, go. Betty, yeah, good. Betty, yeah, oh, there it is. So Betty Glover Garland was my great grandmother. And um, can I see one of the, this is off the record and stop me if it's too much. Just last week, a cousin in Lynchburg, who's 93, sent me a diploma of oh. Betty Glover Garland. <laughs> uh, and this cousin who is, is still in Lynchburg, but the diploma is from the Women's Institute of Domestic Arts and Sciences in Scranton, Pennsylvania, 1925. I had no idea, but we talk about the treasures and wow. And I don't know what is yet to come out of my this. Her, this is cousin Carolyn who lives in Lynchburg. She had so much stuff. I could write another book. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, let's look at some of the records that you looked up on this family. Oh, I want to show you your chart. So your connection to um, this to the passing. So that's you down here with the star at the bottom. And then that's your great grandma up top. Yes. And she's the sister of Goldie. Yes. Okay. Uh, my grandmother, my great grandmother was the oldest of the siblings. And then Goldie is over there to the right with her husband, um, her then husband, Charles Bruce Jr. Okay. So these okay. picture people who have photographs are what I call the players. In my story, the people who either left letters or photographs or something or major part of my story. Okay. And so um, this is one of the letters. So tell us what we're looking at here. Yes. So it's one of the letters from one of Carrie's, I'm sorry, one of Goldie's sisters, Carrie, where she says, Junior has built a ranch house in Westwood, which Chris says is lovely. Chris was another relative. It's, it's one of the, must be the wife of Junior's father. Anyway, but from what she says and does not say, I imagine they are passing. Uh. So Bob 
I'm sorry, Junior's father would have been one of Goldie's brothers. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Went by and visited get the house. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, Goldie's brother, that's how he's living. Okay, you have mm -hmm. another letter um, from Carrie. Tell us about this letter. And this one is about one of the, how should I say it? One of the brothers of Goldie's sons. Okay. And it was Jimmy Glover's son. His name was Ronnie. He was a student at Harvard. And I had a contact at Harvard who was able to find his photograph in the Harvard yearbook. And I'm sure it's the same one. But as my friend who was, um, she actually was an archivist at the Schlesinger Library at Harvard Radcliffe. And she was giving a talk one day at during an Asala conference, which it was the year that they talked about migrations. Okay. And she said people even migrated along race lines. So Ronnie yes. and his people had migrated from black to white. It says going over to the other side altogether now. Yes. So we never see them and don't hear from them either. Yes. I actually have been in touch with some of them in recent okay. years. Now, that's one of the good thing about time. Sometimes if enough time evolves, evolves, people can talk a little bit. And some of these people whose parents lived as white, I mean, they are still living as white, <laughs> but they say things like they kind of knew and da, 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 da. But, it, you know, it's not about, they have to apologize or anything like that. I, I kind of see it as it, it is what it is. It is what it yes. was. Yes. So and let's look at the census record. I want to show <laughs> this because we all get hung up in the census record when mm -hmm. we see mulatto and we see all these different things. So tell us what we're looking at here. Right. This I is so interesting. Can... This is one of those things you wouldn't believe if you didn't really see it. So it's my <laughs> little circle, right? But the census taker had first indicated that those people were Negro. Um, no, first she indicated they were white. Then she changed white. it to Negro. Yes. And I I'm, I'm, would love to know what made her suddenly say they are Negro. And it's funny My how- I mean, page said, that said, they not white. Yeah. <laughs> right. The, the, yeah, somebody down the street, the next door neighbor said they not white. <laughs> And then the census taker was so shaken up, but even when it came to the um, male female, <laughs> it was, she wrote N E G. I was wondering what was going on over here. Yeah. So you never know what you will discover in the census. Record. So when you see mulatto, does that automatically mean mixed race? Theoretically. Theoretically. Now, but you know what? Looking back on some of my ancestors, and I've heard this from other people who do genealogy. Shamel, you've probably seen it too. People who look like you and me are often identified as mulatto back in 1930, 20. I think it depends on the perception of the census taker. Exactly. Maybe black has to be literally pure black slash African. Right. And we know Africans from the continent as we are from as well. But I mean, they, we come in all kinds of shades too. Yes. So all this stuff about color, <laughs> we have just been lying to ourselves, perpetuating all kinds of myths. And it'll just be wonderful when the whole truth is out and people understand that we are just people. That's exactly. My yeah. I thought when we, yeah, I thought when we uh, took the DNA test, we would understand that. You have another letter here. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what is this letter saying, Linda? I think it's coming. There we go. So this is also about Ronald Glover, written by uh, a young, another cousin, not by Carrie. The aunt. Actually, it's written by Carrie's granddaughter. These are people who kept close touch with Goldie over time. And this person who wrote this was... Uh, Oh, Lord, what's her name? Anyway, she actually died a couple of years ago, and I'm just so glad I was able to connect with her before she died. I did not know her when she was growing up, 
Um, and I know her name too well. Um, it said, um, can I read it? Move to yes, Tokyo. You read it. Yes, I'm, I'm rambling. Yes, yes, yes. yes nonstop, yes. got to somewhere like New Mexico, disoriented, et cetera, and spent a month in some kind of clinic. Roger and family, all white in parens, and don't want to know. I think Jimmy is in Florida, not happy either. Ronnie's son is an actor in Hollywood. Guess he passes too. I don't know what stage name he uses. Right. So there's the evidence. And the, you know what ev other evidence we see is it is kind of a mixed up family, right? You know, sometimes people think in order to write about their family history, it has to be about rich and famous, um, intelligent people. <laughs> But this family was obviously a little mixed up. And it was written by Lucy Glover. I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, couldn't think of her name. And Lucy Glover, my cousin, who I didn't meet until we were good and grown, was named after our second great grandmother, Lucy Glover, mother of Goldie. So let's look at, this is Ronald Glover here. Yeah. And he, you know, he's, he's graduated. This is his from Harvard. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is fascinating, Linda. Um, let's look at some of your um, other steps. So we did some general research and then, you know, looking for clues, those census <laughs> records with the cross off is definitely a clue. Um, and the letters, what a tro treasure trove of home sources. That's another reason why these home sources are so key. Um, take a DNA test. Have you, so you said you've been in touch with the side that is passing. Have you, was this through the DNA or was this through other means? It was mainly through other means in this okay. case, because I have some folks on my father's side who also Past. And that I learned about that because of DNA and ancestry. And I'm going to show that chart. Um, and you can help me to point to where the people that we're talking about. Sure. So you see me on the bottom. My father is on the second line. His mother, Lillian Warnick Critchlow, is on the third line. And above her is her father, Franklin George Warnick, who lived as a black man. And next to him, is his brother Edward Warnick, who lived as a white man. So it was just a few years ago, I saw this woman at the bottom, just opposite me, um, Gail, as a DNA cousin. Wow. And I reached out, and you know, we hear these stories about how sometimes we reach out to the so-called white people and they don't always respond. And I don't even reach out to everybody, but when I reached out to Gail, I think I had a response in less than five minutes. Yay! <laughs> and she explained to me, about our great grandfathers, how they were brothers and one lived as white and one lived as black. And she helped me create this chart, but also I learned later that another of her cousins or an aunt or somebody had kind of discovered this stuff back in the 1990s and even had consulted a professional genealogist. You know, like, I, I mean, these are my words. It's like, are we really black? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. But <laughs> the people that I have met, including Gail, and matter of fact, these people were in Pennsylvania, up your way. They they were in Chester County, and there are still descendants in the Philadelphia Chester oh, County. You were the luckiest person in the world that of all places for you to be researching is Chester County, because that is just like God's country when it comes to archives and libraries. Yes. That's you know. Yes. <laughs> so everybody, I think what you're hearing is you got to visit the Chester County archives if you have roots there. It is. Is it the best? It's, it's a dream. Don't get me started because I'll go over time. Okay. Yeah, let's look at our steps. Let's go back to our steps. Yeah, I'll start ranting and raving about them because I absolutely adore them. Step six was to document and share with sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And I noticed, Linda, when we talked about this, how you did say, you know, I'm not going to say their name. Just realize, you know, I think this step is just saying, you're telling other people's stories as well. So be careful. Let's go through all the steps. When race isn't just black and white. Step one is study race in America. 
Step two is to learn about passing. Step three, do general US research. Step four, look for clues. Step five, to take a DNA test. You know, the proof is in the blood and the saliva. Step six is to document and share with sensitivity. Linda, thank you so much for that. We're going to bring back our buddies. And oh, where's he at? You can't leave Jim out. Uh, he must be He's lost stuck. on the internet. Oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> we are not going to have time for our question of the day. I just want to thank everyone for joining us, especially Linda. Linda, that was a very enlightening subject. Um, thank you for adding to the dimension of what we offer here at Genealogy Quick Start. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks -bye. Bye. for having me. Bye.